Descending by Thomas M. Dish Catsup, mustard, pickle, relish, mayonnaise, two kinds of salad dressing, bacon grease and a lemon. Oh yes, two trays of ice cubes. In the cupboard it wasn't much better. Jars and boxes of spices, flour, sugar, salt, and a box of raisins. An empty box of raisins. Not even any coffee. Not even tea, which he hated. Nothing in the mailbox but a bill from Underwoods. Unless we receive the arrears on your account. Four dollars, seventy-five cents in change jingled in his coat pocket. The plunder of the Chianti bottle he had promised himself never to break open. He was spared the unpleasantness of having to sell his books. They had all been sold. The letter to Graham had gone out a week ago. If his brother intended to send something this time, it would have come by now. I should be desperate, he thought. Perhaps I am. He might have looked in the Times, but no, that was too depressing. Applying for jobs at fifty dollars a week and being turned down, not that he blamed them. He wouldn't have hired himself himself. He had been a grasshopper for years. The ants were on to his tricks. He shaved without soap and brushed his shoes to a high polish. He whitened the sepulchre of his unwashed torso with a fresh, starched shirt and chose his sombrous tie from the rack. He began to feel excited and expressed it characteristically by appearing statuesquely icily calm. Descending the stairway to the first floor, he encountered Mrs. Beale, who was pretending to sweep the well-swept floor of the entrance. Good afternoon, or I suppose it's good morning for you, eh? Good afternoon, Mrs. Beale. Your letter come? Not yet. The first of the month isn't far off. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Beale. At the subway station he considered a moment before answering the attendant. One token or two. Two, he decided, after all, he had no choice but to return to his apartment. The first of the month was still a long way off. If Jean Valjean had had a charge account, he would have never gone to prison. Having thus cheered himself, he settled down to enjoy the ads in the subway car. Smoke, try, eat, give, see, drink, use, buy. He thought of Alice with her mushrooms. Eat me. The 34th Street he got off and entered Underwood's department store directly from the train platform. On the main floor he stopped at the cigar stand and bought a carton of cigarettes. Cash or charge? Charge. He handed the clerk the laminated plastic card. The charge was rung up. Fancy groceries was on five. He made his selection judiciously. A jar of instant and a two-pound can of drip-ground coffee, a large tin of corned beef, packaged soups and boxes of pancake mix and condensed milk, jam, peanut butter and honey, six cans of tuna fish, then he indulged himself in perishables, English cookies and Edam cheese, a small frozen pheasant, even fruitcake. He never ate so well as when he was broke. He couldn't afford to. Fourteen dollars, eighty-seven cents. This time, after ringing up his charge, the clerk checked the number on his card against her list of closed or doubtful account. She smiled apologetically and handed the card back. Sorry, but we have to check. I understand. The bag of groceries weighed a good twenty pounds, carrying it with the exquisite casualness of a burglar passing before a policeman 
with his loot, he took the escalator to the bookshop on eight. His choice of books was determined by the same principle as his choice of groceries. First the staples, two Victorian novels he had never read, Vanity Fair and Middlemarch, the Sayers' translation of Dante, and a two-volume anthology of German plays, none of which he had read, a few he had even heard of. Then The Perishables, a sensational novel that had reached the bestseller list via the Supreme Court, and two mysteries. He had begun to feel giddy with self-indulgence. He reached into his jacket pocket for a coin. Heads on a new suit, tails the sky room. Tails. The sky room on fifteen was empty of all but a few women chatting over coffee and cakes. He was able to get a seat by a window. He ordered from the a la carte side of the menu and finished his meal with espresso and baklava. He handed the waitress his credit card and tipped her fifty cents. Dawdling over his second cup of coffee, he began Vanity Fair. Rather to his surprise, he found himself enjoying it. The waitress returned with his card and a receipt for the meal. Since the sky room was on the top floor of Underwoods, there was only one escalator to take now. Descending. Riding down, he continued to read Vanity Fair. He could read anywhere. In restaurants, on subways, even walking down the street. At each landing he made his way from the foot of one escalator to the head of the next without lifting his eyes from the book. When he, when he came to the bargain basement, he would be only a few steps from the subway turnstile. He was halfway through chapter 6, on page 55 to be exact, when he began to feel something amiss. How long does this damn thing take to reach the basement? He stopped at the next landing, but there was no sign to indicate on what floor he was, nor any door by which he might re-enter the store. Did you think from this that he was between floors? He took the escalator down one more flight, only to find the same perplexing absence of landmarks. There was, however, a water fountain, and he stooped to take a drink. I must have gone to a sub-basement, but this was not too likely after all. Escalators were seldom provided for janitors and stock boys. He waited on the landing, watching the steps of the escalator slowly descend toward him, and at the end of their journey telescoped in upon themselves and disappear. He waited a long while and no one else came down the moving steps. Perhaps the store had closed. Having no wristwatch and having rather lost track of the time, he had no way of knowing. At last he reasoned that he had become so engrossed in the Thackeray novel that he had simply stopped on one of the upper landings, say on eight to finish a chapter, and had read on to page 55 without realising that he was making no progress on the escalators. When he read, he could forget everything else. He must therefore still be somewhere above the main floor. The absence of exits, though disconcerting, could be explained by some quirk in the floor plan. The absence of signs was merely a carelessness on the part of the management. He tucked a vanity fair into his shopping bag and stepped into the grilled lip of the down-going escalator. Not, it must be admitted, without a certain degree of reluctance. At each landing he marked his progress by a number spoken aloud. By eight he was uneasy. By fifteen he was desperate. It was, of course, possible that he had to descend two flights of stairs for every floor of the department store. With this possibility in mind, he counted off fifteen more landings. No. 
dazedly and as though to deny the reality of this seemingly interminable stairwell, he continued his descent. When he stopped again at the 45th landing, he was trembling. He was afraid. He rested the shopping bag on the bare concrete floor of the landing. Realising that his arm had gone quite sore from supporting the twenty pounds and more of groceries and books, he discounted the enticing possibility that it was all a dream, for the dream world is the reality of the dreamer, to which he could not weakly surrender. No more than one could surrender to the realities of life. Besides, he was not dreaming, of that he was quite sure. He checked his pulse, it was fast, say eighty a minute. He rode down two more flights, counting his pulse. Eighty, almost exactly. Two flights took only one minute. He could read approximately one page a minute, a little less on an escalator. Suppose he had spent one hour on the escalators while he had read. Sixty minutes... 120 floors, plus 47 that he had counted, 167, the sky room was on 15, 167 minus 15 equals 152, he was in the 152nd sub-basement, that was impossible. The appropriate response was to an impossible situation was to deal with it as though it were commonplace, like Alice in Wonderland. Ergo, he would return to Underwoods the same way he had apparently left it. He would walk up 152 flights of down-going escalators. Taking the steps three at a time and running, it was almost like going up a regular staircase. But after ascending the second escalator in this manner, he found himself already out of breath. There was no hurry. He would not allow himself to be overtaken by panic. No. He picked up the bag of groceries and books he had left on that landing, waited for his breath to return, and darted up a third and fourth flight. While he rested on the landing, he tried to count the steps between floors but this count differed depending on whether he counted with the current or against it, down or up. The average was roughly 18 steps, and the steps appeared to be 8 or 9 inches deep. Each flight was therefore about 12 feet. It was one third of a mile as the plum drops to Underwood's main floor. Dashing up the ninth escalator, the bag of groceries broke open at the bottom, where the thawing pheasant had dampened the paper. Groceries and books tumbled onto the steps, some rolling of their own accord on the landing below, others being transported there by the moving stairs and forming a neat little pile. Only the jam jar had been broken. He stacked the groceries in the corner of the landing, except for the half-thawed pheasant which he stuffed into his coat pocket, anticipating that his ascent would take him well past his dinner hour. Physical exertion had dulled his finer feelings, to be precise his capacity for fear. Like a cross-country runner in his last laps, he thought, single-mindedly of the task at hand and made no effort to understand what he had in any case already decided was not to be understood. He mounted one flight, rested, mounted and rested again. Each mount was wearier, each rest longer. He stopped counting the landings after the 28th, and some time after that, how long he had no idea. His legs gave out and he collapsed to the concrete floor of the landing. His calves were hard, aching knots of muscle. His thighs quivered erratically. He tried to do knee bends and fell backward. Despite his recent dinner, 
assuming that it had been recent. He was hungry, and he devoured the entire pheasant, completely thawed now, without being able to tell if it were raw or had been pre-cooked. This is what it's like to be a cannibal, he thought, as he fell asleep. Sleeping, he dreamed he was falling down a bottomless pit. Waking, he discovered nothing had changed except a dull ache in his legs, which had become a sharp pain. Overhead, a single strip of fluorescent lighting snaked down the stairwell. The mechanical purr of the escalator seemed to have heightened to the roar of a Niagara, and their rate of descent seemed to have increased proportionately. Fever, he decided, he stood up stiffly and flexed some of the soreness from his muscles. Halfway up the third escalator, his legs gave way under him. He attempted to climb again and succeeded. He collapsed again on the next flight, lying on the landing where the escalator had deposited him. He realized that his hunger had returned. He also needed to have water and to let it. The latter necessity he could easily and without fault modesty satisfy. Also, he remembered the water fountain he had drunk from yesterday, and he found another three floors below. It is so much easier going down. His groceries were down there. To go after them now, he would erase whatever progress he had made in his ascent. Perhaps Underwood's main floor was only a few more flights up, or a hundred. There was no way to know. Because he was hungry, and because he was tired, and because the futility of mounting endless flights of descending escalators was, as he now considered it, a labour of Sisyphus. He returned, descended, gave in. At first he allowed the escalator to take him along at its own mild pace, but he soon grew impatient of this. He found that the exercise of running down the steps three at a time was not so exhausting as running up. It was refreshing almost, and by swimming with the current instead of against it, his progress, if such it can be called, was appreciable. In only minutes he was back at his cache of groceries. After eating half the fruit cake and a little cheese, he fashioned his coat into a sort of sling for the groceries, knotting the sleeves together and buttoning it close. With one hand at the collar and a, uh, the other about the hem, he could carry all his food with him. He looked up the descending staircase with a scornful smile, for how he had decided with the wisdom of failure to abandon that venture. If the stairs wished to take him down, then down giddily he would go. Then down he did go, down dizzily, down, down, and always. It seemed faster spinning about lightly on his heels at each landing so that there was hardly any break in the wild speed of his descent. <laughs> He whooped and hallowed and laughed to hear his whoopings echo in the narrow, low-vaulted corridors, following him as though they could not keep up his pace. Down, ever deeper down. Twice he slipped at the landings, and at once he missed his footing in mid-leap on the escalator, hurtled forward, letting go of the sling of groceries, and falling, hands stretched out to cushion him onto the steps, which imperturbably continued their descent. He must have been unconscious then, for he woke up in a pile of groceries with a split cheek and a splitting headache. The telescoping steps of the escalator gently grazed his heels. He knew then his first moment of terror, a premonition that there was no end to his descent. But this feeling gave way quickly to a laughing fit. I'm going to hell, he shouted, though he could not drown with his voice the steady purr of the escalators. This is the way to hell. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. If only I were, he reflected, if that were the case, it would make sense. Not quite orthodox sense. 
but some sense a little. Sanity, however, was so integral to his character that neither hysteria nor horror could long have their way with him. He gathered up his groceries again, relieved to find that only the jar of instant coffee had been broken this time. After reflection, he also discarded the can of drip ground coffee, for which he could conceive no use under the present circumstances, and he would allow himself for the sake of sanity to conceive of no other circumstances than those. He began a more deliberate descent. He returned to Vanity Fair, reading it as he paced down the down-going steps. He did not let himself consider the extent of the abyss into which he was plunging, and the, very, the vicarious excitement of the novel helped him keep his thoughts from his own situation. At page 235, he lunched. That is, he took his second meal of the day on the remainder of the cheese and food cake. At 523, he rested and dined on the English cookies dipped in peanut butter. Perhaps I had better ration my food. If he could regard this absurd dilemma merely as a struggle for survival, another chapter in his own Robertson Crusoe story, he might get to the bottom of this mechanized vortex alive and sane. He thought proudly that many people in his position could not have adjusted, would have gone mad. Of course he was descending. But he was still sane. He had chosen his course and now he was following it. There was no night in the stairwell and scarcely any shadows. He slept when his legs could no longer bear his weight and his eyes were tearful from reading. Sleeping, he dreamed that he was continuing his descent on the escalators, waking his hand resting on the rubber railing that moved along at the same rate as the steps. He discovered this to be the case. Somnambulistically, he had ridden the escalators further down into this mild, interminable hell, leaving behind his bundle of food and even the still unfinished Thackeray novel. Stumbling up the escalators, he began for the first time to cry. Without the novel, there was nothing to think of but this, this. How far, how long did I sleep? His legs, which had only been slightly wearied by his descent, gave out twenty flights up. His spirit gave out soon after. He again had turned round allowed himself to be swept up by the current, or more exactly swept down. The escalator seemed to be travelling more rapidly, the pitch of the steps to be more pronounced, but he no longer trusted the evidence of his senses. I am perhaps insane or sick from hunger, yet I would have run out of food eventually. This will bring the crisis to a head. Optimism, that's the spirit. Continuing his descent, he occupied himself with a closer analysis of his environment, not undertaken with any hope of bettering his condition, but only f for lack of other diversions. The walls and ceilings were hard, smooth and off-white. The escalator steps were a dull nickel colour, the treads being somewhat shinier, the crevices darker. Did that mean that the treads were polished from use, or were they designed in that fashion? The treads were half an inch wide and spaced apart from each other by the same width. They projected slightly over the edge of each step, resembling somewhat the head of a barber's shears. Whenever he stopped at a landing, his attention would become fixed on the illusory disappearance of the steps. As they sank flush to the floor and slid, treading groove into the grilled base plate. Less and less would he run or even walk down the stairs, content merely to ride his chosen step from top to bottom of each flight and at each and at the landing step, left foot right and left again, onto the escalator that would transport him to the floor below. 
The stairwell now had tunnelled by his calculations miles beneath the department store, so many miles that he began to congratulate himself upon his unsought adventure, wondering if he had established some sort of record. Just so a criminal will stand in awe of his own baseness and be proud, most proud of his vilest crimes, which he believes unparalleled. In the days that followed when his only nourishment was the water from the fountains provided at every tenth landing, he thought frequently of food, preparing imaginary meals from the store of groceries he had left behind, saving the ideal sweetness of the honey, the richness of the soup which he would prepare by soaking the powder in the emptied cookie tin, licking the film of gelatin lining the open can of corned beef. When he thought of these six cans of tuna fish, his anxiety became intolerable. For he had, would have had, no way to open them. Merely to stamp on them would not be enough. What then? He turned the question over and over in his head like a squirrel spinning the wheel in its cage to no avail. Then a curious thing happened. He quickened again the speed of his descent, faster now than when at first he had done this. Eagerly, headlong, absolutely heedless. The several landings seemed to flash by like a montage of flight, each scarcely perceived before the next was before him, a demonic, pointless race. And why? He was running, so he thought, towards his store of groceries, either believing that they had been left below, or thinking that he was running up. Clearly he was delirious. It did not last. His weakened body could not maintain the frantic page and he awoke from his delirium, confused and utterly spent. Now began another more rational delirium, a madness fired by logic. Lying on the landing, rubbing a torn muscle in his ankle, he speculated on the nature, origin and purpose of the escalators. Reasoned thought was of no more use to him, however, than unreasoning action. Ingenuity was helpless to solve a riddle that had no answer, which was its own reason. Self-contained and whole. He, not the escalators, needed an answer. Perhaps his most interesting theory was the notion that these escalators were a kind of exercise wheel, like those found in a squirrel cage, from which, because it was a closed system, there could be no escape. This theory required some minor alterations in its conception of the, of the physical universe, which had always appeared highly Euclidean to him before, a universe in which his descent seemingly along a plumb line was, in fact, describing a loop. This theory cheered him, for he might hope, coming full circle, to return to his store of groceries again, if not to Underwoods. Perhaps in his abstracted state he had passed one or the other already several times without observing there was another unrelated theory concerning the measures taken by Underwood's credit department store against delinquent accounts. This was merely paranoia. Theories, I don't need theories, I must get on with it. So favouring his good leg, he continued his descent, although his speculations did not immediately cease. They became, if anything, more metaphysical. They became vague. Eventually he could regard the escalators as being entirely matter-of-fact, requiring no more explanation than by their sheer existence they offered him. He discovered that he was losing weight, being so long without food by the evidence of his beard. He estimated that more than a week had gone by. This was only to be expected. Yet there was another possibility that he could not exclude, that he was approaching the centre of the earth where, as he understood, all things were weightless. Now that, he thought, is something worth striving for. He had discovered a goal. On the other hand, he was dying, a process he did not give all the attention it deserved, unwilling to admit this eventually, and yet not so foolish as to admit any other, he sidestepped the issue by pretending to hope. Maybe someone will rescue me, he hoped. But his hope was as mechanical as the escalators he rode and tended 
in much the same way to sink. Waking and sleeping were no longer distinct states of which he could say, Now I am sleeping, or now I am awake. Sometimes he would discover himself descending, and be unable to tell whether he had been waked from sleep, or roused from inattention. He hallucinated. A woman loaded with packages from Underwoods, and wearing a trim, pillbox-style hat, came down the escalator towards him. Turned round on the landing, high heels clicking smartly, and rode away without even nodding to him. More and more when he awoke, he was roused from his stupor. He found himself, instead of hurrying to his goal, lying on a landing weak, dazed, and beyond hunger. Then he would crawl to the down-going escalator and pull himself onto one of the steps, which he would ride to the bottom, sprawled head foremost, hands on shoulders braced against the treads to keep from skittering bumpily down. At the bottom, he thought, at the bottom I will when I get there. From the bottom which he conceived of as the centre of the earth, there would be literally nowhere to go but up. Probably another chain of escalators, ascending escalators, but preferably an elevator. It was important to believe in a bottom. Thought was becoming as difficult, as demanding and painful as once his struggle to ascend had been. His perceptions were fuzzy. He did not know what was real and what imaginary. He thought he was eating and discovered he was gnawing at his hands. He thought he had come to the bottom. It was a large, high-ceilinged room. Signs pointed to another escalator, ascending. But there was a chain across it and a small typed announcement. Out of order. Please bear with us while the escalators are being repaired. Thank you. The management... He laughed weakly. He devised a way to open the tuna fish cans. He would slip the can sideways beneath the projecting threads of the escalator, just at the point where the steps were sinking flush to the floor. Either the escalator would split the can open, or the can would jam the escalator. Perhaps if one escalator would jam, the whole chain of them would stop. He should have thought of that before, but he was nevertheless quite pleased to have thought of it at all. I might have escaped. His body seemed to weigh so little now. He must have come hundreds of miles. Thousands. Again he descended. Then he was lying at the foot of the escalator. His head rested on the cold metal of the base plate, as, and he was looking at his hand, the fingers of which were pressed into the creviced grill. Worn after another in perfect order, the steps of the escalator slipped into these crevices, tread in groove, rasping at his fingertips, occasionally tearing away a sliver of his flesh. That was the last thing he remembered. <laughs>